Well, first of all, it is a Big Bang model. In other words, there is a Big Bang, but the Big Bang was not the beginning. We physicists have waited a hundred years since 1916 for this photograph. This photograph is the smoking gun. Mm. Now children know that the moon goes around the earth, the earth goes around the sun. But what does the sun go around? <laughs> the sun goes around a black hole at the center of our galaxy. James Webb Space Telescope is upsetting the apple cart. All of a sudden we realize that we may have to rewrite all the textbooks about the beginning of the universe. A new understanding of the universe. We delight in this. Black holes might just be one of the most fascinating and mysterious phenomena in the universe. They are massive beasts in terms of power, but at the same time, they are virtually invisible to us. However, because of the research that was put into them over the last couple of decades, we've gone from knowing absolutely nothing about them to learning more and more up close and personal. While things have just gotten crazier, Michio Kaku just announced that we've finally gotten a look at what's inside a black hole. And this new information brings light to the details the world of science might have missed all along. Join us as we dig deeper into black holes and unveil what's inside space's big bad. But what are black holes? Before we get into the details of what Michio Kaku found, we have to talk about what really are black holes. Even though most of us have some idea of what black holes are, there are still some gaps in the right information. In 1916, Albert Einstein published his theory of general relativity, which predicted the existence of black holes. At that time, the concept of black holes was purely theoretical. It took another 50 years for the scientific community to find evidence that black holes actually exist. This happened in the 1960s when they were studying the Cygnus constellation. They noticed an oddly bright blue star that was emitting X-rays. This star wasn't a stagnant object but was going around a giant black something. Upon further investigation, it was found that the X-rays weren't just moving around on their own, but they were being sucked into the black thing they were orbiting. Thus, the name black hole. This discovery was significant because it provided proof that black holes actually exist and were not just a figment of Albert Einstein's wild imagination. While that was great, it also meant that there was this unreal entity in space that we urgently needed to know more about. So researchers all around the world got to work. This black hole was named Cygnus X1, and it is located in the constellation Cygnus, about 6,000 light years from Earth, and it was no small discovery. It's about 14 times brighter than the Sun and incredibly dense, which causes it to have a strong gravitational pull. The gravitational pull is so strong that not even light can escape it. This is why it is called a black hole. The concept of a black hole is both fascinating and terrifying. Anything that gets too close to a black hole will be pulled into it never to be seen again. But that aspect of danger makes it even more necessary to learn everything there is to know about them. Later after the discovery of Cygnus X1, scientists started to search for other black holes. They found that there may be close to over 100 million black holes in the Milky Way alone. But because they are so incredibly hard to detect, we still don't have an exact number. Nevertheless, from the looks of it, there are several million black holes in the Milky Way, in our very galaxy, which is what makes them even more important to study. So let's break it down. The main concern with black holes is always going to be gravity. Their gravitational pull is so intense that anything that enters it compresses down astronomically until it becomes a singularity. In simpler terms, black holes are like cosmic vacuum cleaners that suck everything in. One of the scariest parts about their search that's gone into black holes is the fact that if someone were to fall into one, they would get stretched to the point that they become a single line. This process would happen slowly, and the person would die before the final form actually sets in. So let's just say that no one should be stepping into one. In 2021, scientists were able to release the first clear photograph of a black hole, specifically the M87 black hole. This black hole was photographed several nights in a row, and with each photograph, the researchers gathered more and more evidence about it. They had to stitch the individual photos together to create something that filled all the gaps. This way, they were able to figure out that there are three layers to a black hole. It's not just one single gaping hole of nothingness as many people believe, 
things are a lot more complicated than that. To even get to the nothingness part of a black hole, you have to make it through the first two layers. But what are these layers? The first layer is called the event horizon, which is the point of no return. Once you pass the event horizon, there's no turning back, and you will be sucked into the black hole. From there on out, the second layer is the photon sphere, which is the region where light orbits the black hole. Any light that enters this region will be trapped and will not be able to escape the black hole's gravitational pull. Finally, we come to the third layer, which is the singularity. This is where everything that enters the black hole gets compressed down astronomically until it becomes a singularity. The singularity is a point in space-time where the laws of physics, as we know them, break down, and we just can't predict what happens next. At the singularity, the density is infinite, and the laws of physics, as we know them, cease to exist. Now, what makes all of this infinitely worse is the fact that every single black hole you study will be entirely different from the last. Sure, they do tend to follow the same three-layer concept, but the way they function could be vastly different. Now if this were anything else, all we need to do is hop back on those telescopes and just study the problem at hand in detail. But with black holes, you can't really do that. Scientists can only study black holes indirectly by observing the radiation they emit and the gas and dust that surrounds them. Sending a probe like Voyager inside a black hole is not possible because anything that enters the event horizon is pulled towards the singularity where it is compressed to an infinitely small point. So you can't exactly waste billions of dollars just to get a glimpse every time because the second the probe gets close enough, it'll just crush into nothingness. Because of that glaring problem, scientists are left with no option but to study these objects in a two-dimensional way, even though they are three-dimensional phenomena in reality. That doesn't mean that the researchers haven't been busy. There are lots of different theories and explanations of black holes, and with each one, things get more and more interesting. One of the most compelling theories about the formation of black holes is that they are created from collapsed stars. When a star exhausts all of its fuel, it can no longer produce enough energy to counteract the force of gravity that is constantly pulling inward. As a result, the star begins to collapse in on itself, becoming smaller and denser as it does so. If the star is massive enough, this process can continue until it becomes a singularity. To understand the nature of black holes in death, NASA scientists turned their attention to the core of the galaxy M87. Astronomers observed a super-powerful whirlpool of super-hot hydrogen gas that was spinning at an astonishing rate of 1.2 million miles per hour. The sheer force of this spinning disk of gas would have caused it to violently fly apart in all directions, but it didn't. Scientists deduced that there had to be a colossal mass concentrated at the center of the galaxy to prevent this from happening. This massive object weighed as much as 2 to 3 billion suns and could only be a black hole. But that's not the only theory where black holes spin. In 1963, the New Zealand mathematician Roy Kerr used Einstein's equations of gravity to provide the best description of a spinning black hole. Kerr showed that a spinning black hole wouldn't collapse into a point as previously thought but to a ring of fire or a thin disk. The disk would be spinning so rapidly that centrifugal forces would keep it from collapsing. This spinning disk of matter is called the ergosphere and it is the region surrounding the black hole where the laws of physics start to break down. But the most intriguing feature of Kerr's solution was that it predicted the existence of an Einstein-Rosen bridge, also known as a wormhole. This is a theoretical passage through space-time that connects two separate regions of the universe, or even two parallel universes. The idea is that if one were to fall into a black hole, instead of being crushed to oblivion, one would be sucked down a tunnel through the ring of fire and shot out a white hole in a parallel universe. To understand how this works, we need to look at the concept of space-time. In Einstein's theory, space and time are not separate entities but are interconnected, forming a four-dimensional fabric called space-time. Objects with mass warp this fabric, creating a gravitational field that causes other objects to move toward them. This is the basic idea behind a wormhole. It's a shortcut through space-time that connects two distant points in an instant. Wormholes aren't just a sci-fi concept, they are actually a prediction of general relativity, although no one has ever observed one directly. 
The reason is that wormholes are inherently unstable and would collapse almost immediately. But the existence of an Einstein-Rosen bridge would mean that black holes are not just cosmic vacuum cleaners but could also be portals to other regions of space-time. So, could we use a wormhole to travel through space and time? Unfortunately, the answer is probably no, not yet anyway. Even if we could stabilize a wormhole, it's unlikely that we could use it to travel faster than light. Einstein's theory of special relativity predicts that the speed of light is an absolute limit on how fast anything can travel through space-time. But even then, the theory of wormholes and black holes as pathways to other parts of the universe or even to different times has been a subject of fascination and speculation among physicists for decades. The idea that there might be shortcuts through the fabric of space-time, allowing travel through great distances or even into the past, could possibly be revolutionary if we could actually achieve it. While the idea of wormholes as a means of interstellar travel or time travel is certainly exciting, as we've glossed over before, it's also a subject of controversy and debate among physicists. Some have pointed out that wormholes and particularly, Kerr wormholes might be unstable or impossible to traverse due to the intense radiation and subatomic forces surrounding their entrance. In order to truly understand the nature of these phenomena, a new theory is needed that can unite the laws of gravity with a quantum theory of radiation. Throughout the world of science, this is called a theory of everything, a single theory that can unite both Einstein's theory of gravity and the quantum theory. Michio Kaku, who is a renowned theoretical physicist, has been working on a theory of everything for decades too. While there are lots of different versions of what this could be, the only one that has shown promise is superstring theory. Superstring theory unites gravity with the theory of radiation. The theory proposes that subatomic particles are actually tiny vibrating strings and that the universe is a symphony of these strings. Just as different musical notes correspond to different vibrations of a violin string, different particles in nature correspond to different vibrations of a superstring. One of the fascinating things about superstring theory is that as a string moves in time, it warps the fabric of space around it, producing black holes, wormholes, and other exotic solutions of Einstein's equations. This means that superstring theory not only unites Einstein's theory of gravity with the quantum theory, but it also explains many of the mysterious phenomena that we observe in the universe. But there's something about this theory that really throws a wrench into how simple it might sound at first, but in a way makes more sense too. The superstring theory requires 10 dimensions of space-time in which the strings can vibrate. This is quite different from the three dimensions of space and one dimension of time that we experience in our everyday lives. It's difficult to imagine what these extra dimensions might be like, but physicists have developed some conceptual models that can help us understand. Consider a two-dimensional pond inhabited by fish that are only aware of the dimensions of length and width. To these fish, there is no such thing as height, and they can't even imagine what it might be like to live in a three-dimensional world. But if rain falls on the pond and causes ripples, the fish can see the effects of the third dimension, even if they can't actually experience it directly. Similarly, physicists believe that we can't see the extra dimensions of space-time directly, but we can observe their effects on the world that we experience. In particular, the vibrations of the strings in superstring theory can produce waves of energy that travel through the extra dimensions of space-time. These waves can manifest themselves as particles with different properties, such as mass and charge. In this way, superstring theory can potentially explain all of the particles and forces that we observe in the universe, including gravity. But there is a catch. The extra dimensions of space-time that superstring theory requires are so small that we can't really study them directly. So how can we even know that the extra dimensions exist? One possibility is that the extra dimensions are curled up so tightly that they are invisible to us. Imagine a sheet of paper that has been tightly rolled up into a cylinder. If you were an ant walking along the surface of the paper, you might not even notice that the paper is curved. Similarly, the extra dimensions of space-time and superstring theory could be curled up into tiny loops or spirals that are invisible to us, even though they affect the behavior of the strings that vibrate in them. Another possibility is that the extra dimensions were more visible at the beginning of the universe during the Big Bang. So in a way, we've already narrowed things down significantly. 
Maybe the Big Bang wasn't really all that big after all. It also didn't make a loud noise like one might expect from a bang. The Big Bang theory doesn't provide an explanation for what caused the supposed bang or how it occurred. It simply states that it did happen. The truth is we need a theory that can account for what happened before the Big Bang. This is where string theory comes in. According to this theory, our universe might have been formed from the collision of two separate universes or it could have emerged from another universe like a baby being born from its mother. This connection between universes is called a wormhole, which is like a tube connecting two bubbles. It's possible that we may have already discovered evidence of this umbilical cord that connected our universe to another. In a way, we could just be living inside a black hole this whole time but not know it. Think about it. Because we exist in four dimensions and can't see anything beyond it, it's possible that we're actually in a black hole, and the black holes we're studying are actually wormholes to these other dimensions. Do you think there could be truth to that theory? Let us know in the comments below. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, and we'll see you in the next one.